my friends, we are nearing the end uh, of a day that I hope has been inspiring uh, and thought-provoking and maybe slightly exhausting. Uh, I wanna ask you uh, to, to be with us and to give great attention uh, to our last speaker of the day. Uh, we're really privileged to have Alec Foster with us. He is a co-founder of the Student Net Alliance. This is a group uh, that is taking on these challenges much more broadly of trying to figure out uh, how college students, university students, uh, can become lead actors uh, around these issues that we've been talking about. And that's really where we're going in our work here and in some of the creative and brainstorming work that we're doing tomorrow and into the tactical work that we're doing tomorrow afternoon. And we're really lucky to have Alec uh, talk about the work that SNA has done and I hope inspire us for the work that we're gonna do tomorrow. So, no further ado. Thank you. Is this on? Perfect. Greetings, everyone. My name is Alec Foster, and as Ethan mentioned, I am the founder of Student Debt Alliance. Before I d dive right in, I want to direct your attention to these enormous uh, white papers to your right. Those uh, will be used uh, in conjunction with the post-it notes that are on each of your tables. As I'm going through this talk, I encourage you to write down a few things, any thoughts that you have, uh, particularly as they fall in those categories, as we can, so to allow us to lead into tomorrow's uh, workshops. The categories are just campaign ideas, things that you want to see us uh, expand into, um, and wh what success looks like in a, in a student movement, what decision makers we should target, how a student movement can be sustained, what structures work best for a student movement, uh, the core, comp core competencies of a student-run movement, uh, tactics that we can use, um, and any other things that you just want to share because it's not a student movement or a movement at all if it's just me talking to all of you. So I really hope to, uh, to hear from you. So just to start off, I wanna give you a quick introduction to myself. I uh, graduated from New York University in 2014 and I studied communications and politics and I wrote a thesis on hacktivism and how the internet impacts organizational structures. And to back up a few years, uh, I have been in student organizing since I was 14 uh, in criminal justice reform and drug policy reform. And, this, and student organizing has always been an interest of mine as, as, as has policy reform been. But my interest in uh, internet policy was peaked in college when I realized that the internet was not just a, a place that you go and do internet things, but that it's completely interwoven with our daily lives in that it impacts every single other movement. So I, I knew I wanted to get involved and uh, save the internet. Uh, as a naive 20-year-old, or I guess 19 at the time, I thought that the way to do this was to go into government and to do uh, pu public service in the way of, um, of this program that I heard of called CyberCore, which I heard of through my uh, university's email list. CyberCore is the NSA's recruitment program. They don't say that, and uh, I didn't know that until I was already accepted. Uh, what CyberCourt is, is a, uh, it's a scholarship program that gives students like myself that are interested in public service and have a light technical background $70,000 per year to, uh, to take intense cybersecurity courses and then work for at least two years at the NSA, CIA, FBI, or another three-letter cybersecurity agency. Uh, I, I had some issues with this once I learned more about the, the details, but it really wasn't until the Snowden leaks that uh, until I, I and also many other of my colleagues in this program learned about what was really going on behind those closed doors. And, uh, and, and I, it, it, it took me some time. I, I had a lot of cognitive dissonance at, at, this, at this point. It was, well, it seems like an obvious decision to leave this program uh, in retrospect. Uh, it was pretty hard because you legitimize these things in your mind when you spend so much time and energy and, uh, and just like you know, many, many like years of your life working towards this goal that you realize was, uh, was just the, a fake pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So I, uh, I, I uh, wanted to I have an impact on this when I, I decided to leave this program. Uh, and and I, leaving a program like this after investing so much time, I knew that I couldn't just walk away from this and like, move on with a, diff a different chapter of my life. I still really cared about keeping the internet safe and I knew that I could have an impact. So 
I uh, gave, had a stab at writing my first petition around internet organizing, and it was to let uh, companies publish the number of government data requests that they receive. And uh, this petition, it, in the span of a couple weeks, got like 10,000 signatures. And it wasn't the first petition I had written, but it made me realize that the internet is a great place to do internet activism. Uh, activists like us, are, are, are this is where we live, and, and, uh, and these things can spread like wildfire. And after that, I started thinking about other ways I could get involved. And as I mentioned, I've been involved in drug policy reform for many years. I have, I'm on the board of directors of an organization called Students for Sensible Drug Policy, which is a student-run uh, drug policy reform and harm reduction organization with a uh, board of directors composed uh, mostly of students and with uh, paid staff members, which are non-students and some students. But uh, it's, it's an extremely impactful organization that's been around for 16 years. And I was a chapter leader in college. And I was thinking, you know, th this, this organization has done so much good and we've changed laws and changed school policies uh, all over the world. And yet there's no student voice in the internet policy debate. I wondered why, why is this missing? Um, and I had previously been to a few meetings uh, of the organization Students for Free Culture uh, at their chapter at NYU. And when I went to these meetings, it was myself and like three other people uh, that were just on the board of the organization, and no one else really showed up. And I was you know, questioning why this was. And after talking to the former president of this organization, which uh, since dissolved, um, he said, uh, one, the, the chapters were isolated, especially after the umbrella organization kind of like changed their focus away from students um, into uh, the, like a, another free culture organization. And they also, um, uh, they, they just weren't able to attract many people to their meetings. And this was a surprise to me, uh, coming from a, like Students for Sensible Drug Policy, which was able to bring out like, like 40 plus students to most of our meetings. Uh, and I realized that, you know, internet policy, uh, like, it, it doesn't have the same social aspect as drug policy reform does. And, and I thought, you know, why am I trying to stick this old model of student organizing onto this movement that is really, like, built for the 21st century? So it got me thinking about a new type of organization, which is where I came up with the idea for Student Net Alliance in October 2013. Uh, so my idea for this organization would be less focused on chapters and rather focused on campus coordinators that would treat their entire university as their chapter, using the internet to leverage these networks and getting into positions of power to make uh, impactful, impactful changes on their campus and getting their university to, to take positions that could have an impact far beyond uh, their campus walls. So, so uh, another thing about what I wanted this organization to be was a uh, student run. I, I really like the structure of students for sensible drug policy in this model. And I wanted, uh, like, no matter what, to have this organization be the voice of students, which were missing from this debate, there, uh, or from many debates. And, and I, I knew there's plenty of other organizations that were active on these issues, like NSA recruitment on college campuses, net neutrality, free culture, and access. But I, I wanted to have this organization like, be first and foremost responsible to our constituency, to our students, educators, and alumni. Uh, and I also wanted this organization to be decentralized. And I thought that why, maybe we could like, embed decentralization into the structure of the organization itself. If, if I, if I thought if I just like, push technology into it, like maybe it'll just be more democratic, kind of like the internet itself. And that was a, a goal for me. I wanted to show that uh, an organization uh, that is built to save the internet can use the internet to accomplish that goal. So I, I, went, about, uh, going, I went about doing this um, and trying to form a global coalition that empowered students and, uh, and, and also was a, was a uh, like we had many goals, but I also wanted to uh, find other students like myself that were in these NSA recruitment programs and help them know that there is another way. So I, I, before I talk to you about the successes and failures of the organization in the past year or two, I want to tell you a little bit more about my philosophy of activism and how this has shaped the organization. So 
Uh, like m many of the speakers before me have emphasized, I truly believe in uh, getting into positions of power and leveraging your network. Uh, at, at NYU, I was able to uh, create some changes regarding our open data sets and uh, by get, becoming a student senator and getting on our school's technology and research committee and then uh, yelling at all my friends, telling them to sign this thing and then, sh and then being able to demonstrate that need to the university's administration. And, and, that, and I was, with the support of the student government, we were able to do things that like, violated the CFAA, because, but not having to worry about repercussions because we were the policymakers. Like, like we were scraping data sets from our school's um, course registrar, uh, things that we, we couldn't really imagine doing on our own. Um, but with, with the official support, it was uh, fairly feasible. Next uh, was this thinking critically about our stakeholders, uh, the people that, that had the um, power to make decisions. I, I think this was mostly most important uh, uh, at university, at the university level, because it's less clear there. Some, it's not always the university president. Sometimes it's the vice president of student affairs, the, the people in charge of the libraries, uh, your, your IT uh, department. Uh, and it's, it's a little clear as you move out of the university, but we also, I also knew that each university is structured differently and that no one knows the structure of their university better than the students themselves. Uh, third is my philosophy of balancing like top-down versus bottom-up organizing. I had previously like, d done a lot of like, research into the SOPA and PIPA protests, and while I, it was extremely motivating to see like, a grassroots movement, I also realized that it, you, there, it was still organized by like powerful institutions that were able to drive people to places where they could all take a common impactful action. And that I, I wanted to be able to um, like guide, guide students and, and our constituencies towards meaningful action, um, but at the same, and, and like doing so in a democratic way, involving them in these decisions, but making sure that we were all coordinated when we could. Uh, and, and, and on that note, it's having sh shared power and authority. That's always been a central tenet of Student Net Alliance. And, and I wanted to make this organization democratic by giving each university a vote on, uh, our, on our board members, as well as uh, students um, through just decisions that we, that, the, that we make and just constantly seeking feedback. Uh, my, one of my fifth, uh, my fifth tenet would be, I guess, balancing easy and meaningful act activism with uh, high-level, like, template-based actions. What I mean by this is, like, cr creating petitions that actually go somewhere, that aren't just list-building exercises, and um, ma making it so that uh, just reducing the number of steps that, that one uh, needs to take to have an action, so that my friends that aren't, like, as involved in this movement can feel like they're making a difference without having to spend more than three minutes uh, on a single action. But at the same time, balancing that with high-level impactful actions that uh, other people that, are, that would consider themselves internet activists can take. And uh, one great example of this, which I'll go into more detail later, was uh, a letter writing campaign that we scaled across uh, universities by creating a, we had a global letter which anyone could sign, but also we created a, a template which uh, active students at their universities could personalize, put on our uh, site, and then have students at their university sign it, which targeted their university's decision makers. Um, so and that, that was an extremely successful campaign that I would like to do more things alike. Uh, and my, my last, uh, the last note of my philosophy was this, that money doesn't matter. Uh, I, I st started this organization with a $3,000 grant, and, and I've put my own money into it too. But I realized that most of the important things that we did uh, didn't cost anything. And organizing on the internet is a lot cheaper than it was to like rent out a big room and provide pizza to everyone. As I mean, we, we still do that, but uh, but it, it's it's a lot cheaper uh, when you can do things over social media and email uh, and and groups. And that for me, it, it, at first, it was a it was a large barrier because I was worried about fundraising, uh, and 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 I think that if if I could go back now, I would have focused more on like building up the chapters and less on like organizational development 
uh, to, to, to get things off the ground because once you have the, the people, the, the, the other things will follow. Uh, I also want to tell you uh, the six key values that when I started Student Net Alliance I had in mind. Uh, first was social engagement uh, and incentivizing activism. I, I had this idea that in order to join Student Net Alliance, you had to sign this pledge of like, supporting the free and open internet. But that after you signed, you would be, and you, had a, and you could prove that you're a student, you'd be invited to our private community where you could swap organizing tactics, discuss things with other internet activists, access our database of tools, and you'd also be given a, a personalized link that you could share and recruit other people to join the organization and sign our petition. And we'd incentivize this through having a like, Reddit-like karma system. And because uh, I, I, I don't mean to gamify activism, but I think that, that it's, a, it's, 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 it's hard when you're on your own as a student. You, you can sometimes, and from a global organization with people that you've never met, sometimes you can feel a bit disconnected. And, and I wanted to, like, like incentivize people to do more and allow them to collect like influence in our organization by proving that they're a seasoned activist, that they're, uh, that they're involved with the organization. And part of that is just having good like internet, like so socializing tactics and being able to get a message out. Uh, the the, the next, uh, next value was uh, a, a student controlled agenda. So I wanted to make sure that everything that we're working on was with the, uh, the, the support of our constituents, and I wanted it to be uh, democratic and from the ground up. Uh, third is uh, collaboration and partnership. Uh, and what I mean by that is like influencing leadership, uh, like, like whether it's students in your student government or, uh, or people in uh, elected positions or appointed positions, and also uh, recognizing that that Student Net Alliance is an alliance. It's, it can be made up of groups with their own name uh, that can just fall under this umbrella organization, which is why I n never called it the Student Net Alliance, but it's just, it's more of a, it's like a, it's like a brand or a mantra that anyone can join, like Anonymous. Uh, and next would be, just, um, I, already, I already discussed shared power and authority, so I'll skip over that, but essentially just giving the schools autonomy to work on their own, uh, uh, their own issues, uh, having transparency in our organization and accountability. Uh, and also in inclusion, like recognizing that like the internet, the organization should be a level playing field uh, and like, anyone is welcome to join, uh, whether their status is, whether they're a student or not, uh, whether from, from any country. And also um, recognizing that, that this, our students know their schools better than anyone else. And that's where we can have the most impact and, because, and where there aren't any other organizations uh, primarily focused on. So now I'd like to tell you a little bit about our successes and, uh, and some campaigns that, we're, that I'm proud of and some campaigns that we started but haven't finished. Uh, the first is uh, the letter writing campaign, uh, Students Against Surveillance. Uh, this I'm particularly proud of this campaign because of how it leveraged both the like, high level and low level actions. Uh, we had, 17, we had uh, 17 universities, uh, or at least students from 17 universities, including, and, and faculty, uh, writing letters, and also a high school student, uh, on behalf of their schools and school districts, which, uh, they, and, and they spread that within their schools. And we actually got responses through these. Uh, at, at, at NYU, um, our school president like, clarified their commitment to, the univers to universities as a a bastion of free speech, and that uh, surveillance uh, like has a chilling effect on that. And it was great to have that uh, that, that reinforcement. And we got uh, across the un across the campuses. I think we got something somewhere around 600 signatures. But it was uh, it, it was it was extremely motivating. Um, the, the next was just a, a few petitions that we wrote. Uh, we we I, I wrote petitions regarding uh, the that and bear in mind that these weren't. Uh, not all of these were student specific, but they spoke from the student voice, and we primarily tried to a appeal to students. We wrote a net neutrality petition that got 100,000 signatures, um, a uh, internet freedom, or uh, the internet uh, uh, tax freedom uh, act uh, renewal uh, petition got around 150,000 th signatures. Um, and, and all in all, we got over like a, a quarter of a million signatures, which I thought was great for being a, like a new organization. Um, 
And, and also we are able to turn, uh, with, with EFF's help, we are able to turn signatures on our net neutrality petition into comments for the FCC by linking them to EFF's uh, comment writing tool. Next uh, was another, uh, another campaign which is still in progress, but we released some data from this was the uh, Campus Internet Policy Gradebook. This campaign, um, in this campaign, we asked uh, students at our universities to uh, grade their universities on, I think, 11 different criteria, uh, such as does your university spy on your students? Do they have an NSA recruitment program? Do they have a tour, tour node? Do they so, like, uh, oppose patent reform? And like, basically any issue that you would want uh, to evaluate your university on. Like how some, there, there's, a, there's other organizations that do this. I, I got the idea from SSDP, which does this around drug policy, but you can even look up, like, like so students rate their universities on all types of things, whether from gym facilities to the hotness of the guys. So I figure that this would like bode very well for students that are uh, trying to decide what university to go to. And I think that, um, that you know, your, your freedom of speech is a, a huge component of where you should decide to educate yourself. Uh, that we released a, a batch of the data regarding NSA recruitment, but we're still, uh, we're, we're still working on building up this data set. And I'll, I'll talk about some problems we encountered uh, with, with get, gathering this data um, later on. But essentially, it comes down to when you're an organization of volunteers, it's hard to convince someone to uh, spend hours upon hours sifting through data when no one's getting paid. Um, the next is this an anti-NSA recruitment uh, program. It is reaching out to students that were in the program I was in and uh, speaking with news outlets about my decision to leave. Uh, this, it, it, I, I still feel anxious just thinking about this, uh, about my decision to leave, and, and I know how hard it is. Um, but, but I just wanted to let people know that there's alternatives to that. And another campaign that is yet to be launched uh, is, our, uh, is our career services program or, uh, or, uh, or, partner, or, or student net alliance partnerships program, where we ask companies uh, that want to partner with us to, uh, if, if they meet a requirement, if they fulfill, I think, like half of the criteria, meaning their site uses like SSL encryption, they, uh, They've like uh, openly uh, opposed NSA surveillance. They publish a transparency report. They're student founded, or they don't have uh, unpaid internships. Uh, like th things like that, that that benefit students. Uh, if if they meet that criteria, they can apply to join our, our partnership program, where we would give them a badge, which they could put on their site, and just kind of in increase their credibility in our community. And we'd also uh, uh, help students uh, find internships at these companies. We haven't yet, yet launched this, but it's something uh, that's on the horizon. Um, and next would, would also just be, um, oh yeah, we, we hosted five hackathons in our first year, which were uh, really useful in demonstrating the need for uh, more open data sets at, at universities. At, at my school, uh, you couldn't even use the university's logo or name in creating an app for the university. And after, with the student government's assistance, we hosted a hackathon and showed uh, that with, with a little bit of support, these students can create services that are much better than the services, than the technological services that the university provides. Next is, um, uh, we also competed in a few policy case competitions, uh, just like creating our proposals and like getting like kind of deep in the weeds with what uh, like good internet policy in particular, um, this was before USA Freedom was passed, but what an ideal uh, reform, uh, NSA reform bill for phone metadata would look like. Um, and also, uh, like, while this isn't something that we've like, pioneered, we're extremely supportive of what EFF has been doing with, uh, like, with uh, furthering university transparency reports. And I know that, uh, for the, I think one has just been released at uh, University of California, Berkeley, and we really want to see more of that. And personally, uh, one thing I've really, uh, uh, one, one reassuring uh, thing I've realized while uh, working with Student Net Alliance was that we can work together online. Uh, I, I, I've, like, it was kind of an experiment to see whether I could like, m work on a board of directors with students across the country that I haven't met. Uh, I even, uh, Rob over there, as, as a, a fellow board member, this is the first time we've met. 
in person. And we've known each other for two years and have worked side by side on many campaigns. So I think it's like a testament to the internet's ability to facilitate activism. Now, here comes the, the, the this kind of sad part, or not the sad part, but like looking forward and looking behind me at what we could have done better and what, and like areas that I could have uh, done better. Uh, I guess one, real, one realization I had early on was that in order to um, manage this organization effectively, we needed a paid staff member. And I think that we were too ambitious in taking on too many projects, trying to develop our own platform, uh, trying to get a, like a student network started, trying to get 501c3 status. Like it was just, we just tried to take on too much. And what I think we should have done was secured a, like a little bit of money first just to have one paid non-student staff member that, wasn't, that, that, that could uh, like spend some time on these campaigns and manage our campus coordinators and chapters. Because when you're a student and you have a, a student schedule, it can be hard to stick to, uh, uh, to, 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 to follow up on these things. And, and we, we learned that the hard way. Uh, next was that you can't do everything online. Like while the internet was a great place to do activism, we, like, we had very regular conference calls. And, and also in my, in my apartment, I like brought a few people in and like on weekends, we would just hammer it out for eight hours. Uh, and, and still that wasn't enough. Uh, and so I, I think that maybe as the technology progresses, like perhaps it'll be easier to work with people uh, across spaces but there is still value in sharing an office and, and like sharing a space where you can like focus on the same things. Uh, I, I think there's, there's still value in that. Next would be, it's, it's hard to build your own platform and get people on it. And we had some like ethical decisions about whether to use like Facebook as our like primary communications tool with how like they handle like, with like privacy concerns. But we realized that uh, like we were trying to build our own platform or working with other students, working on a platform to adapt for activism. It was, it was hard, especially as a new movement, a, a new organization. Uh, people would like come onto this and check it out, but then not really log in again. And, and I, think, I think we should have worked on that after we had had a larger network of students under our umbrella. Uh, next would be, uh, as I mentioned, just not scaling up too fast. I think that we could have delayed uh, the, the process of trying to become a 501c3 uh, because it's a lot of effing paperwork and it's, it takes a lot of time and the, the, the benefit to it uh, would not have helped us as much in the beginning. I, if, if I could go back, I would have spent more time looking for uh, a 501c3 to sponsor our 501c3 status. Uh, we, we went to EFF for this, but unfortunately they declined, but for good reason. Uh, because it's, uh, it's, it's hard to oversee a network when students could be saying anything that could go against like a, a legal case. Um, and also there was others that uh, like potentially wanted to sponsor us like Tech Freedom, but we didn't want to change our position on net neutrality. So, I, but like going back to my previous point that you know, the money doesn't really matter. Uh, we, we could have delayed this until, like, until a few years later. Um, next was, and, and this is gonna be like, like very personal to me, um, but I, I hit a wall um, uh, about after the first year. I got extremely burnt out. I was like writing a thesis and finishing my senior year, and, and I, I felt like I had this whole student movement on my back, and I became extremely fatigued, and I felt like I was failing uh, the people that I looked up to. In particular, I, I, for, for instance, there was emails from EFF staff from, from people in this room that I, just, I left unresponded, or that I never responded to, because I felt like I just need to be working harder on this, that I wasn't doing enough, and I felt terrible. And then until I like, had more conversations with activists in my position, and I realized this is something that we all go through. And I think, I think a good metaphor for uh, this um, like empty feeling that you can have being an activist facing uh, insurmountable problems is modern petition platforms. Like earlier this week, I was uh, getting some friends of mine to sign the uh, ACLU's Cal ECPA petition on their website. And because we, we were at 9,996 signatures out of 10,000. 
I thought, all right, I can get four friends to sign this. Like, the goal is just 10,000. We're almost there. Like, come on, guys, we'll sign this. And then I just watch it, 97, 98, 99, 10,000. And then as soon as it hits 10,000, the goal gets increased to 15,000. And this, you see this on change.org. You see this on, like, most petition platforms. And it's a way of, of showing that you're almost there, but you, you can never reach that goal. And that's how I felt uh, in, like, very often in this movement. It, it was a... Uh, like very disheartening, and I and this is I know this is like I'm putting this under the category of lessons learned, but I'm still learning this lesson. I'm still learning to be easier on myself so that I can like pick the ball back up and start dribbling before I start slam dunking. So that's something I'm continuing to work on, and 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 I think like coming to events like this and and also hearing that like I'm not the only one that goes through these issues. That there's uh, other people that experience hardship. Uh, it, it makes me feel a, a lot more supported, and I, I'm really happy to have like been here, even just for that. Um, so, where do we go from here? S Student Net Alliance has, by by and large, like, s like slowed down uh, in the past half a year. Um, e like even our website isn't online right now, uh, as technical difficulties. But I. I, I think there's room for for new for new students to join this movement. Not it could be under the Student Debt Alliance banner, and I'm happy to like share everything that we have. We have we have some great resources. Whether it's a list with tens of thousands of people on it, um, like really well written bylaws. Uh, we're like a registered nonprofit in California, but the truth is I, I have a full time job now, and I'm lucky that I can still work on these issues in my job as an activist, but I can't be like a, champ, a champion of, stu of a student movement. And I need other people to work with on this, whether it's uh, uh, institutions or uh, students in this room or, f or friends of yours that might want to take this on, whether they're a student, alumni, um, even if you don't want to take on the whole thing. Uh, there's certain campaigns like the like students, uh, like the Students Against Surveillance campaign, which we keep writing letters for, the campus, uh, the, the, the company partnerships uh, that, which campaign, which I described, um, or the, uh, the internet, campus internet policy gradebook, which I think will be uh, e extremely useful at shaming universities to uh, change their policies. I, I think these are all like, ver like very effective like actions in a box, which are just waiting for more people to take it on. And, 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 I'm, and I think that there's, there's still room for a movement like this to be sustained. My, my goal from the beginning uh, was to be able to start something that I could walk away from at a certain point and have it continue beyond my influence. And I don't think Student Net Alliance is there yet, but that doesn't mean that, but we're right, we're, where we are right now is a different place than where we were a year ago. I remember like, the early conversations in summer 2014 about th this conference, and I remember we just didn't have the numbers to make it happen then. But now, like looking, like, looking at you all here and in hearing all of your stories, I feel like there's never been more of a ripe time to, uh, to do that. So I'm extremely excited to see where this goes, and uh, I'm incredibly humbled to uh, have this opportunity to speak to you all. So with that, I want to thank you for your time and for your energy in this long day. And I'd be happy to take some questions about the organization or anything else you'd like to ask. Thank you. Alec, thank you so much for that. And, and let me just say, I just want to thank everybody who's spoken from their heart today, because we've had a lot of honesty uh, about how hard this work is. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I don't want to gloss over that message. I mean, the work that we're trying to do uh, is really hard. It's hard to make change in the world, and it's hard for people personally. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly inspiring uh, to see people who've tried stuff, who've failed, who've tried other stuff, and who keep moving forward. And I'm looking towards Wendy Seltzer there, because uh, the, the, the right to fail is one of my favorite ideas that mm -hmm. sort of come out today. Um, let's give Alec a couple of questions, and then I'm going to explain to us how dinner works, how tomorrow works, and then I'm going to loose the hounds on the buffet. Uh, so let's see if we've got a, a, a couple of questions first. Anything that anyone wants to put to Alec? 
We can obviously do this informally as well, but let's take advantage of being on stage and with mics. Hey, how you doing? Uh, I, I just managed to get uh, the Wayback Machine to take a look Perfect. at the site, yeah. look, look at a bunch <laughs> of these Missing things. some photos, but I appreciate that you, that you took the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, what, I, what I was interested in, like what the, what actual, what were the causes? A lot of them are like mass surveillance, but is there anything mm -hmm. about, um, so one thing I really care about is a, uh, uh, censored content at universities mm -hmm. uh, being like directly affected by that at US Boston because yeah. we have some problems. But uh, so, like, any causes that you've encountered uh, at other universities or, or in this thing that, that related to like, um, I guess, like outbound mm -hmm. blocking of access, or, mm -hmm. or is it really just like was surveillance? Like, was that the dominant type? That's of a great question. So, the, the reason that most of the things that you saw on our website were national issues is because as we're starting up, uh, like while we did have students like myself taking actions at our universities, like on, on a national level uh, with our board, like just in order to get our name out there, we're just getting signed on to letters, like, like, like co-signing with other organizations and collaborating on uh, days of opposition. And mass surveillance was a topic particularly of, of particular importance to myself, but, but I, we, there, there's no topic that's like off limits. And one of the things I liked about Student Net Alliance was that it can evolve in ways that uh, other student movements that tried to address issues like students for free culture uh, weren't really flexible enough to uh, to like uh, adopt new issues as they came about. So to answer your question, uh, yes, at, at we we left those campaigns to the individual schools um, and students at those schools in order to bring them to us and so that we could support them in those campaigns. Uh, like I remember at one school there was uh, like so there's some censorship in a computer science class about not discussing Tor or like privacy tools because uh, the university thought they could use, be used for ill will. Um, but we, we haven't, we, we didn't do any uh, work addressing, uh, addressing like censorship in terms of like materials. Uh, and I, I would be interested in hearing more about that uh, afterwards if you have a moment. Thank you. Thanks. So I think you're onto something hugely powerful with this kind of Yelp your school idea, mm -hmm. and I would encourage you to keep that up because I think that's, you know, if there's anything, if there's one pressure point that every university responds to, it's image. They're just utterly obsessed mm -hmm. with their image. And I have this fantasy about going to college recruitment fairs and standing outside with a little card to hand kids as they're walking into the college recruitment fair so they can read these questions mm -hmm. to the recruiter, right? And if you had six people all ask, you know, hey, do you guys have a contract with a company that monitors my social media so I can be disciplined for what I write off campus? Mm -hmm. And that recruiter goes back to their boss and says, you will never guess what six people asked me at this thing, right? I mean, that becomes a consumer, you know, mm -hmm. choice issue there I think is very powerful. C could you just maybe like elaborate on, you know, what your results were with that, how you got that in front of people and what was the delivery system and the response rate? So we actually haven't executed that campaign yet. We only released the data that we received uh, on universities that were part of the NSA's like Center for Academic Excellence programs or had CyberCorps at their universities. But rather, we've collected data and verified it from around 25 uh, institutions, may, actually maybe more, but I, I think that we wanted to get some more before we released it. And, and I, I think we just got hung up uh, in like, the, like the, the organizational development process and just didn't have enough time to finish that campaign. But I, I'm like, that's one of the things I'm like most confident about. And I, I think that having like the students at the universities do some proactive outreach to their student bodies, uh, like educating them on these issues will be a big part of it. But I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to see where that goes. I don't have an answer for you yet, but I would, would like to get that, that out there as soon as possible. We, we actually have a form online um, which I can like, refer current students to that they can fill out on their own universities. That's how we were collecting the data at first. We'd, we'd have them uh, fill, out a, fill out a form um, and have them like, kind of grade their university on these policies and also link to the policy pages so that we could verify them. Uh, I, I thought it would be a bad practice just to put up grades without checking them, but it's, it's, it's still like a, a very manual process. Do we have a last question for Alec? Awesome. I'll give you the last word. Almost the last word. Alec actually gets the last word. And then a after that, I get the last word because I keep holding on mm -hmm. to it. So it's not just me keeping people back from the buffet. It's mm -hmm. great. Um, so my question is probably less of a question for you, but for everyone else. And thank you for your talk. And I really kind of um, can symp sympathize with what you're, you were saying about 
uh, having uh, a lot of work and kind of getting run down and burnt out because mm -hmm. I'm in kind of that exact position right now. Um, I described to someone last night that I'm in kind of in the trough of a sine wave uh, right now, which I don't know if that... It's a good analogy. I feel you. <laughs> so, I, I, well, the question to you is, have you found anything to bring you out of that? And the question for everyone else in the room is, is there any strategy or anything anyone else does in the room mm -hmm. to kind of bring you out of the trough of a sine wave? Because it really sucks being, being there. Uh, I really appreciate that question. I'm glad I can end on this note. Uh, for, from what I've done, like in the past year, I've just focused on, on my health a lot. I actually had to kind of take a step back. And as much as it, as, as it hurt me and I felt like I was letting people down, I really needed to focus on my health. Like when I was like at the end of my senior year, I was staying up until the sun rose every day just because I felt so much pressure and just couldn't sleep. Um, but but in, in terms of what what I've now realized like is is more helpful than just like stepping back and waiting until I can like address it on my own. I think just talking to other people in this movement. Um, like, I, I had a conversation with Shahid a, a few days ago that like put me in like really good spirits because it kind of confirms like what you and I know that it's 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 a lot of pressure and you can feel like the world is on your back. Like it's, especially when it comes to um, pioneering in a new space. And I, and I, I felt like there were times I felt like when um, if I didn't do it, no one else would, or that that this this whole thing depends on me. But that's not true. We're we're all in this in, we're all in this together, and there's many others like you and me that can like pick up the ball when you need it to take some time uh, f for yourself. But other than that, just having like normal s sleep habits. Um, Drinking less coffee and taking less stimulants, <laughs> eat, eating better, uh, just just being just treating yourself well and like be, taking it easy on yourself is what I'd recommend. What, what, one of the things that I discovered looking at at uh, Twitter's trending topics in Boston today, where by the way, freedom to innovate was a trending topic for a good chunk of the day, mm -hmm. uh, was that the number one trending topic today is uh, World Mental Health Day. Uh, and I actually, uh, it's completely a happy accident, but I don't think it's entirely an accident. Uh, uh, trying to figure out how to take care of yourself, trying to figure out how to make your life sustainable as an activist, uh, whether you're doing this as a student, whether you're doing this as a professor, whether you're doing this as a professional, uh, this is a problem for every single person uh, mm -hmm. who wants to change the world. Uh, and it's something that we all should take seriously and it's something that I want to take seriously as an organizer of this event, which is why I'm going to end now and let us eat some dinner, uh, which is part of mental health as well. So first, <laughs> let's thank Alec. Thank you. Thank you so much. Second, while we're clapping, let's thank everybody who's spoken today. <laughs> while we're still clapping, let's thank everybody who asked a question today. A lot of great questions. Mm -hmm. Let us quickly, before we forget how much work it is to do these things, thank the folks who've been great about doing the AV, who've been great about doing the taping. Thank everybody who's helped us have a wonderful buffet ahead of us, get this room set up, get this whole conference organized. We're incredibly grateful to everyone who's been involved with it. I'm gonna mention them once again, thank you to the Ford Foundation for making it possible for us to do this and to come together and do this. Incredibly grateful for their support on this, and I'd like applause on that too. And now, I'm gonna explain what's ahead of us. So, 